This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Frequently people get together in a setting such as this, and along with their dinner they serve wine to drink. Is there anything wrong with that? Is that appropriate? You know, popular liquor commercials that air on television conclude with the words, drink responsibly. And alcohol commercials depict healthy, athletic people having a good time and engaging in outdoor adventures. Are those commercials accurate? Are they painting a, a true picture of what alcohol will do for you? And is it possible to drink responsibly? I want to talk with you for a few minutes about the other side of this picture. I know that alcohol has many defenders, but I like what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, alcohol has many defenders, but no defense. I want us to begin by considering the evil effects of alcohol. And I want to start with a verse from the Bible, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. The Bible says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. In the United States of America, every day there are more than 700,000 people who receive treatment for alcoholism. In the year 2002, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, 41% of all the deaths that occurred in traffic accidents were alcohol-related. Now that means that every 30 minutes someone was killed in a traffic accident because of alcohol. You know, if there were a disease that, that was killing off this many people, the government would be vehemently warning against it, and funds would be given to study it and to try to find a cure. We'd be having telethons to raise money to find a vaccine. But alcohol instead is promoted and advertised at every turn. In the year 2000, the alcohol industry spent $1.42 billion on advertising through television, radio, print, and outdoor advertising. The resources spent on advertising alcohol is enough to feed 20 million people. One study says that young people view approximately 20,000 commercials each year, of which 2,000 are for beer and wine. Now that's an average of more than five TV commercials per day. Now do you think it has an effect? The median age at which children begin drinking is 15.7 years old. One statistic that I read said that college students spend approximately five and a half billion dollars each year on alcohol. Now get this, that is more than they spend on soft drinks, milk, juice, tea, coffee, and books combined. About 18 million Americans experience problems with alcohol and 10 million are alcoholics. Alcohol is involved in 50% of spouse abuse cases. 38% of child abuse cases, 65% of drownings, 54% of those in, in jail for violent crimes are there because of the use of alcohol. 49% of those convicted for murder or attempted murder had been drinking when they committed those crimes. Now, I could go on and on with statistics like these, and as powerful as these statistics are, I'm not going to bore you with any more of them. Neither do I want to spend all of my time talking about binge drinking or, or drunkenness or any of those things, because just about everyone would agree that those things are wrong, at least anyone who, who says they respect the Bible, because the Bible so plainly states it. Galatians 5.21 says that drunkenness is a work of the flesh committed by those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. It, it's very plain. There's no doubt about it. Everybody believes that. But you see, the problem is generally not over what we call drunkenness, it's over what is called social drinking, or what some people would call drinking in moderation. That is people drinking at their meal, like a setting such as this, or people drinking at a wedding, or getting together with other people for the purpose of recreation and just having a few drinks. Now that's where the argument starts with a lot of people. Now, we could approach this subject from several different standpoints, but what I want to do is to look at the arguments that are made by religious people, people who say they have respect for the Bible, and I want to look at some of the, the best efforts they make to defend what we call social drinking. All right, let, let's consider some of the arguments that are made in defense of social drinking. Number one, here's the first one. Sometimes it's said 
There is not any verse in the New Testament that specifically forbids drinking in moderation. All of the verses address only the subject of drunkenness. What about that? First, let me say this. There are a lot of things that are not specifically condemned in the Scriptures, but are still wrong. You know, using heroin is not specifically condemned, but who's going to argue that since the New Testament doesn't specifically command people to abstain from heroin, then its use must not be forbidden. But you know, many things in the Scriptures are forbidden in principle. Now listen to me. I do not believe, listen carefully, I do not believe this is the case when it comes to drinking. I don't believe drinking is forbidden in principle only, but rather that it is forbidden specifically. Now you say, where? The answer is in every verse that forbids drunkenness. Now a person might say, I don't understand. You're saying that social drinking is forbidden in the verses that discuss drunkenness? What are you talking about? Let me explain this. In Ephesians 5.18, the King James Version says this, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now the phrase, be not drunk, is translated from the Greek root, methusko. That word means, according to Young's Analytical Concordance, to begin to be softened. According to S.T. Bloomfield, to moisten, or to be moistened with liquor, and in a figurative sense, to be saturated with drink. E.W. Bullinger says, Methusko means to grow drunk, marking the beginning of Methuo. Now this word, Methusko, is an inceptive verb. It's a word that marks the process of becoming drunk. So what Paul is actually saying here is, do not begin the process of becoming drunk. And when a person consumes alcohol, he is beginning to be softened. He is beginning to be intoxicated. And that's why I say social drinking is condemned in the verses that discuss drunkenness and, and in the word drunk. The implication here is that persons begin to be drunk when they begin to drink. Now, I believe that the reason people struggle with this is, is because of what they see, or, or perhaps I should say because of what they don't see. If they don't see the person staggering or in a drunken stupor, then they don't consider the person to be drunk. But that's not the Bible basis upon uh, which drunkenness is determined. And I think science and, and medical studies also bear out the fact that when a person begins to drink, they are to some degree drunk. So how much alcohol does a person have to, to drink in order to be affected? As early as the 1960s, the Journal of the American Medical Association stated, there is no minimum of blood alcohol concentration which can be set at which there will be absolutely no effect. Now somebody might say, well, that, that's old. You know, we're wiser now. We, we have had scientific advancements in the last 40 years. Listen to this quote from the Journal of the American Medical Association dated May 3rd in the year 2000. It says, although legal limits for blood alcohol content levels have been set in most states, impairment in driving skills can occur with any amount of alcohol in the bloodstream. Now listen to this. There's a website. It's overseen by the University of Oklahoma Police Department. You can go to this website. You can put in your weight. You can put in what you're drinking, the length of time you're drinking, the number of drinks, and it will approximate your blood alcohol content. Now, I did some samples for a 160-pound person. That's approxim approximately what I weigh. I put in one drink, five ounces of fortified dessert wine, drinking it immediately. It said that it put this person at 0 0.05 blood alcohol content. A 160 pound person, one drink, 12 ounces of reduced alcohol beer. Now notice, reduced alcohol beer, drinking it over a period of one hour, put them at 0 0.02 blood alcohol content. Now, you say that doesn't mean anything to me. What is, what is 0 0.02? What does that mean? Another website at stopimpaireddriving.org says that at 0 0.02, there's some loss of judgment, relaxation, slight body warmth, altered mood, decline in visual functions uh, such as rapid tracking of a moving target, decline in ability to perform two tasks at the same time, a divided attention, 
the world admits, not even considering religious people, but the world admits some amount of drunkenness, impairment, loss of judgment, soberness, how, however you want to say it, with one drink. Now, in light of that, how can a Christian possibly defend social drinking? With one drink, you are already affected or impaired to that extent. And it gets worse with each consecutive drink. And so the Bible does condemn social drinking. And it's in the verses that discuss drunkenness. Okay, I want to show you another verse. It's 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Now, I want you to notice that Peter condemns drinking parties. Now, the commentator, Albert Barnes, wrote about this verse. Now, listen, it's a, it's a lengthy section we're going to discuss here. He said, the idea in this passage is that it is improper for Christians to meet together for the purpose of drinking. Now, before we go any further, let's ask this. What does that do to the idea of social drinking? You know, another reference book by Richard Trench in Synonyms of the New Testament says that the Greek word here means the drinking bout, the banquet, the symposium, not of necessity excessive, but giving opportunity for excess. Now, if that's a correct understanding of this word, then the idea is that drinking parties are wrong regardless of whether or not we get drunk. All right, let's continue with Albert Barnes' comments. This is what he has to say about the phrase drinking parties. He says, The thing forbidden by it is an assembling together for the purpose of drinking. The idea in this passage is that it is improper for Christians to meet together for the purpose of drinking as wine, toast, etc. It would forbid, therefore, an attendance on all those celebrations in which drinking toast is understood to be an essential part of the festivities, and all those where hilarity and joyfulness are sought to be produced by the intoxicating bowl. And he, he ends by saying this, such are not proper places for Christians. Now, let's consider a second argument. Sometimes people will appeal to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, and they will say that this passage shows that alcohol is only wrong when used in excess. Thus, moderate drinking would be okay. Well, let's consider this passage. The King James Version says this, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And so the argument says this. The person would argue, see, drinking alcohol in moderation is not condemned. It's drinking it in excess that is a problem. Now this argument, I believe, is really a misunderstanding of the word excess. The word doesn't refer to an excessive amount of alcohol. It refers to excessive behavior, ungodly behavior. The American Standard says, and be not drunken with wine, wherein is riot. Instead of using the word excess, it says riot. I think that better conveys the idea. The idea then is this. Remember, this is an in inceptive verb. Don't begin drinking alcohol, which brings ungodly behavior, but rather be filled with the Spirit, which will have the opposite effect. All right, number three, let's consider another argument that sometimes is made in defense of social drinking. This argument would say that drinking wine has health benefits. This is sometimes used by people who are seeking to defend social drinking, and they will refer to a study which states that drinking one glass of wine per day is actually good for your health. Now, first, I would say that this argument really diverts attention from the real issue. When people get together to drink socially, they're not doing it for the health benefits. When people have a party and they have an open bar, the purpose is not out of concern for people's hearts and their medical conditions. This argument's just a, a smokescreen. But anyway, they're referring to a study that says that there's a chemical substance in wine called resveratrol, which helps prevent cardiovascular disease and cancer. I want to read you something from the Mayo Clinic website concerning this issue. It's dated March 9, 2007. The American Heart Association doesn't recommend, it does not recommend that you start drinking alcohol just to prevent heart disease. Alcohol can be addictive. Too much increases your risk of, of high blood pressure, 
high triglycerides, liver damage, obesity, certain types of cancer, accidents, and other problems. In addition, even small amounts of alcohol can cause cardiomyopathy, weakened heart muscle, and heart failure in some people. Now here's one more quote. This is from Martha Grogan, a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic. She's answering the question, does grape juice have the same benefits as red wine? She says, there is evidence that drinking red wine may reduce your risk of heart disease. This benefit is most likely due to a substance called resveratrol found in the skin and seeds of grapes, especially dark red and purple grapes. Resveratrol is also found in grape juice, especially juice made from the dark purple Concord grapes. Recent studies have suggested, she says, that red and purple grape juices may provide the same heart-healthy benefits of red wine. And she goes on to say this, both red wine and grape juice also contain antioxidants, which have been shown to increase your good cholesterol and lower your risk of clogged arteries and may help uh, lower blood pressure. And so this argument's just a smokescreen and really isn't worth considering. A fourth argument that sometimes people make is they will say Paul told Timothy to drink wine for his stomach's sake. Well, let's read it. It says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. 1 Timothy 5.23. First, I'm not quite sure why social drinkers go to this passage at all, because this passage isn't talking about having alcohol at a party or drinking with your buddies. It's discussing alcohol as a medicine. You know, most people believe that Timothy's stomach problem was related to the water in Asia Minor, which could be very dangerous. And what Paul is saying here is an elliptical statement. He's saying, be no longer a drinker of water alone, water only, but with it, take a little wine. Now, secondly, it's worth noticing that Paul had to instruct Timothy to drink wine for his stomach's sake. Now, that suggests two things. First, Timothy had reservations about doing it. Secondly, if it was common for the early Christians to do this, then Paul's encouragement wouldn't have been needed in the first place. And you know, there's a, a big difference in medicine and beer. The person who wants to defend having a beer with his buddies is not going to find support for it in this verse. All right, number five, a fifth argument that sometimes is made is people will say in Bible times they had no way to prevent fermentation and therefore they must have drunk alcoholic wine. Now, here's how the process works. Grape juice is composed of two leading elements, sugar and gluten. The decay of the gluten is what causes the growth of yeast germs. And in the presence of the yeast, the sugar in grape juice is gradually converted into alcohol. Now, the ancients actually had figured out a number of different ways to prevent this process from occurring. In W.D. Jeffcoat's book, The Bible and Social Drinking, he goes into a detailed explanation of, of these processes. But I want to mention just very briefly four processes. One is boiling. The water would be evaporated out so that fermentation could not occur. Then later, the water is re-added to reconstitute the juice. A second process was through the use of sulfur. The juice was exposed to sulfur fumes and then sealed and kept until it was used, and that would prevent fermentation. A third process was cooling. The juice was kept at a temperature below 45 degrees Fahrenheit by placing it in airtight jars and immersing them in springs or storing them in caves where it was cool. Fourth, filtration. The yeast was strained out of the juice, thereby stopping the process. Plutarch said, wine is rendered old or feeble when it is frequently filtered. The strength of the spirit being thus excluded, the wine neither inflames the brain nor infests the mind and passions and is much more pleasant to drink. Number six, a sixth argument that sometimes people make is they will say Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. First, it is not the case that any time we see the word wine in the Bible that it always refers to an alcoholic drink. The word wine is a generic word, and it can refer to either fermented or unfermented juice of the grape. The context has to be used to determine which one is meant, whether it is alcoholic or non-alcoholic. Now, let's look at some examples. Here is an alcoholic uh, passage. 
In Proverbs 23, 31, the Bible says, Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Now, that was clearly alcoholic. Now, here's an example of non-alcoholic usage. In Isaiah 16, 10, the Bible says, In the vineyards there will be no singing, nor will there be shouting. No treaders will tread out wine in the presses. Clearly non-alcoholic. Here's another example, Isaiah 65, 8. As the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, Do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. Now here it's still in the grapes, but it's called wine. Now, in all of these passages, the same Hebrew word is translated by our English word, wine. And the same thing's true in the New Testament with reference to the Greek language. In the New Testament, there are five different Greek terms for wine. The one most commonly used is oinos. It's used sometimes of fermented wine and sometimes of unfermented wine or grape juice. So a person should never assume that because the word wine is used that he's talking about alcoholic wine. Well, what about the argument that Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding feast and therefore he endorsed social drinking? First, the person making that argument has to prove that it was alcoholic wine, which he cannot do. Secondly, I believe the context indicates just the opposite. I want you to, to notice this passage in John chapter 2 and verse 10. After Jesus had turned the water into wine, the governor of the feast tasted it. And this is what he said in verse 10. And he said unto him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. Now what's interesting to note is the phrase, well drunk. Some translations translate this as, as drunk freely. Thomas Summers states, drunk freely suggests the idea of drunk largely. I think the way we would say it today is they had, uh, they had all they wanted until they had had plenty. Now, if this were truly alcoholic wine, then these people would have already violated the passages that everyone would agree prohibit drunkenness. And what we would have is this. If this is truly alcoholic wine being considered, you would have a group of people who have drunk freely of alcoholic wine. They have drunk alcoholic wine until they were well wined. They have drunk alcoholic wine until they'd had plenty. And then we would have Jesus making 120 to 160 gallons more of alcoholic wine for people who had already finished off the first round. Now, how could the Lord forbid drunkenness and then do that? I think it's also interesting that the governor of the feast had not yet had his senses dulled. He could readily discern the good wine from that which was worse, which would be indicative of the fact that he had not been drinking alcoholic wine. So what's the point of all this? The point is that the word oinos, wine, can mean either alcoholic or non-alcoholic. And the context of John 2 points to non-alcoholic wine. Here's a seventh argument. Sometimes people will argue from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3 that elders are required to not be given to wine, whereas in verse 8, deacons are not to be given to much wine. Now, of course, the argument that they make is that this passage implies that elders can't have any wine, but that deacons can have some wine just as long as it's not too much. You know, it's argued that these two phrases, not given to wine and not given to much wine, give implied consent for deacons to drink wine in moderation. First, we need to understand that warnings against excess can never be used as approval for the action itself. For example, the Bible says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Now, this verse is, of course, not approval for practicing wrath prior to sundown. <laughs> And 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, again, shows the fallacy of this implied consent argument. Verse 3 mentions the excess of wine. Now, some folks would say, see, that only condemns wine in excess. Or they might argue that this verse implies consent for wine so long as it's not excessive. In other words, moderate drinking is okay. But the passage goes on in the next verse to discuss excess of riot. 
Now, if this implied consent argument is accurate, then in this verse, in this very next verse, the same context, then we would have divine sanction for riot in moderation. Certainly, that's not a valid argument. Ecclesiastes 7.17 says, Be not overmuch wicked, in the American Standard Version. Well, if we want to use this argument, would that imply it's okay to be a little bit wicked? James 1.21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Does that mean it's okay to have wickedness so long as it's not overflowing? Now let me show you where this argument will take you, just how absurd this will get. Let's assume for a moment that, that it's true that elders can't drink at all, but that deacons can drink in moderation. Well, this same phrase that's applied to deacons in 1 Timothy 3, 8 is applied to the aged women in Titus chapter 2 and verse 3. And so the aged woman could also drink in moderation, if this were true. But very interestingly, it's not applied to the younger women. And so they, the younger women, cannot drink. In addition, in 1 Timothy 3.11, in describing deacons' wives, the word sober is used in the King James. The New King James uses the word temperate. The Greek word here means to abstain from wine. Titus 2.2 requires aged men not to come near wine. Now let's put all of this together and, and see what we get. If we were to apply this, elders can't drink at all, but deacons can. Older men can't drink, but older women can. Deacons can drink, but their wives can't. Who would believe this? It's absolute nonsense. But that's where these arguments will get you when you're trying to defend social drinking. Number eight, let's consider another argument that sometimes people use. They'll go to Luke chapter 7, verses 33 and 34, and they will say, in that context, Jesus was accused of being a wine bibber. Now, they will say this accusation would not have been made had he not been a person who drank alcoholic wine. Well, let's read the passage. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, the accusation is that he would not have been accused of being a wine bibber or a drunkard if he had not been drinking alcoholic wine. I would ask, why not? They said that John had a demon. Where was the evidence for that? There wasn't any. It was a lie. The point is, they were jumping to conclusions not warranted by the evidence. There's, there's really no argument here. Number nine, sometimes it's argued from Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16 that we should not uh, impede upon another's liberty. Let's, let's look at the passage and then discuss it. It says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. Now, it's argued that we have no right to judge another person with regard to what they eat or drink. But you know, this passage is dealing with matters of liberty, matters of opinion, not matters in which the Lord has mandated right or wrong. These were issues related to the old law. And there were some who were trying to bind food and drink issues of the law of Moses. The point of this passage is, don't let any man bind on you what God has not. The old law had been nailed to the cross, and so you're not accountable to it. The food and drink issues here relate to food and drink that had been considered ceremonially clean or unclean. It has nothing to do with matters that are sinful, such as drinking alcohol socially. Number 10, sometimes people cite famous preachers in defense of social drinking, and it's been argued that the well-known preacher Guy in Woods recognized that Jesus only stated fruit of the vine on the Lord's table, and therefore fermented or non-fermented could be used. And he does say that. I've read it in his questions and answers. But first I would say this, Guy in Woods is not the authority, the Bible is. But secondly, I want to read you something else Guy in Woods wrote. He wrote, obviously, any man, elder, deacon, preacher, Bible school teacher, or other person in the church cannot set the proper example of Christian living 
who engages in the use in any degree of that which has been the occasion of so much sorrow, grief, and ruin in the world. Temperance in the use of harmful things is total abstinence. There is no such thing as a proper, moderate use of drugs, alcohol, and other harmful substances. Well, what if I haven't persuaded you? What if you're not convinced that the Bible prohibits social drinking? Then there's still something else that I want you to consider, and that is your influence. When a person who professes to be a Christian drinks alcoholic beverages, he is doing something that even the world sees as an adult vice, and he greatly damages his influence. He's doing something that even the world understands is wrong. I think he's also doing something that's going to make himself a stumbling block to young Christians and certainly to new converts. I want to read you a passage from 1 Corinthians 8, verses 10 through 13. The Apostle Paul is discussing meat offered to idols. Now, I believe the context is different because he's discussing something that is not in and of itself wrong. But of course, those who argue for social drinking don't believe that it is wrong. Uh, they believe that it's not necessarily sinful. But listen to what Paul says. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Now Paul is saying, someone may see me doing it, and it may cause him to sin, and in light of that, I will never do it. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, it's going to be a lot harder to do that. In fact, I would say it's going to be impossible to do that if you have a beer in your hand. Several years ago, I heard a preacher tell about a man in Florida. The man's name was Wilson Thomas. Mr. Thomas had had a hard day at work, and he'd stopped to have a drink and unwind before he went home to his little boy, Randall. Well, he'd had a few drinks, and, and he took one bottle home with him. But when he was almost home, a small boy on a bicycle came out in the road in front of him, and Mr. Thomas swerved to miss him, and maybe he would have if his senses had not been dulled by alcohol. Anyway, he hit the boy, and it killed him. In a panic, he kept going, and he sped home. Several hours later, when the police came to arrest him, they found him in his attic crying and drinking. And it was only then that he found out that the boy that he killed was his own son, Randall. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise.